and welcome to History and Lowell with me, Maritza Grooms. And today we have a special guest, Christoph Strobel, professor of UMass Lowell. You teach history, mm -hmm. right? And global history as well. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, our friend Bob couldn't be here today. Unfortunately, but yes. I'm so glad that you could join us today. So thank you for well, being thanks, here. Thanks for having me, yeah. Absolutely. And you're here to, t to talk about Native American history mm -hmm. in this area. Yeah. So who is here? <laughs> <laughs> Seems like a rather simple question, but it's a bit more complicated. So I think that most history textbooks and Native American scholars of Native American studies or Native American history would say the group here is called the Penacook. And in fact, that's what most Native people with roots in this area self-identify themselves as. But as so often, it is a bit more complicated. There's a long history of colonization uh, that brings all kinds of uh, issues, mm -hmm. which, as we'll probably learn later in discussion when we talk a little bit more about it, why this was so harmful. Mm -hmm. um, but there's other names out there too. So um, Pawtucket, which also happened to be the name likely of this native one of the Native American settlements that was here in around 1600 um, is often also a name used by the English colonists to describe the groups of, of Native people that live in the Merrimack River Valley. So Pawtucket, Penacook, um, and these are all names that people that live here for a long time, they pop up every now and then. Mm -hmm. And another term that is also used by especially early New English colonists to sort of call it, to name the, the native people north of, of Boston, to, so to speak, uh, is the Aborigines. And that might be, the root might be Aboriginal, mm -hmm. or it might be maybe Abenaki, mm -hmm. and people just misunderstood it. Again, with a lot of these terms like Penacook, Pawtucket, we don't necessarily understand all that much and you have all kinds of hypotheses and claims of where the names come from. But so that is the lay of the land uh, right. roughly in around w what uh, yes, with, with the Native Americans in, in Lowell, yes. Right, and this is, they, they were here for centuries before. Yeah, millennia. I mean there is pretty good evidence that traces the indigenous Native American presence back to a at least 10,000 years in wow. New England and wow. it's hard to gauge was there anything before minus two three thousand years who knows but that's where most anthropologists would argue at least an indigenous presence for about or a, an indigenous presence for about 10,000 years and it must be very hard to get any kind of historical evidence because of how the land has changed so much over time with the digging of the canals <laughs> to build all the mills yeah. and everything um, so, but we do know that they were here, yeah. and we do know that they used this land, and they lived off of this land, mm -hmm. and they had a they had very specific methods in order to survive here. Can yep. you tell us about some of that? Yeah, well, I mean, there is a by the time like let's use 1600 as our arbitrary date. By the time 1600 rolls around, there's first off a long established history, and there's like thousands of years of evidence despite the destruction. I mean, right. you look at the construction of, of downtown Lowell, there was a praying, com praying town community, so a, a religious a New England mission here, you won't find much evidence about mm. that. So you're absolutely correct. And, and it's pretty clear that all the major uh, mill city, I mean, Manchester, New Hampshire is built right on one of the most important Native <laughs> American sites. And, of course. Um, and then Lawrence, same thing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But just to trace it back, um, Yes, there are life ways that are established. Uh, farming is well established, uh, and the area we're sitting on is likely have been has been farmed by Native people for several hundred years uh, before the coming of of, of, of the English. Uh, Robin Hill supposedly is an old in what is today Chelmsford is an also an old established Native American farming site. Wow. So there's a lot of farming here. Uh, it's digging stick agriculture. Native Americans don't have domesticated animals. Well, I mean, the a in the Andes Mountains, they had the llama, and Native Americans up here have the dog. 
but, but that's the extent of it. And that's another important role in explaining the issue of disease, but I'm sure we'll get to this. So let's stick um, to, uh, because of the lack of animals, mm -hmm. there's the issue of epidemics, but there's also the issue of meat supply. Right. How do you get protein in your diet? So there's two things around. There's the forests, and then there's the river, right? Mm -hmm. So let's start with the forest. Um, because Native Americans don't have uh, agricultural animals, they come up with very sophisticated ways of, uh, of, of forest efficiency and forest management. And so the Native people in the eastern woodlands just burn the undergrowth, which takes care of the bushes, and you have the big trees. It spaces the trees out very far. So as the, some of the early colonists, right, how they could really take their horse and buggies into the woods and drive around. Mm -hmm. So it might have looked more like a park landscape than to what we're used to our New England's, our New England woods looking today. But that also spurs growth of grass, mm -hmm. which increases the deer population, and so it makes it a lot more efficient to hunt. So yes, we talk about it as, as hunting, Mm -hmm. But it's, in a sense, kind of like a free grazing, uh, like raise your deer and shoot it on the spot <laughs> kind of right. way of, yeah. of it. I mean, if you'd market it differently, you could probably right. get some, some hipsters today very <laughs> excited about that. But so that's that. But then we also have the river. And if you get closer to the coast, you have also have the ocean. And mm -hmm. Native Americans use um, use those resources quite mm -hmm. dramatically. Fishing and shellfish, and the shellfish then, mussels and so on, are used for utensils. They, they pop beca they're, they're, they're used as, as for, for on top of the holes and so on to just have the digging sticks and so on. Right. So, um, so the forest, they use this technological way of making their own meat come to them, mm -hmm. pretty much, and then we have all of this water all around us, all the rivers and yep. everything. And, but the water was also important for other things like meetings, yes. right? And so people would converge, mm -hmm. right, at these meeting places yes. at like the Pawtucket Falls. Yes, and you have the Pawtucket Settlement and you have the Pawtucket Falls. And it's likely that in the spring when the fish swam up the river, like salmon and other varieties of fish, to spawn upstream, they jumped over the falls made it easier to hunt and that was also a time in history when Native Americans got together and they held council. Uh, it must have been probably quite the party. Uh, right. Lots of fish <laughs> to eat, yum, right? And then all your friends that you haven't seen for a year would be there and probably also for a, a place for young mm -hmm. men and women to meet. And right, yes, yes. And, and those kinds of things, yes. <laughs> New so, celebrations. Yes, maybe. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, 17th century or early 17th century or 16th century life, not that different from us today, right? Right, um, yes. right. But then things started happening. We have the new English that were coming in. Mm -hmm. And so these meetings maybe started getting a bit more serious. They had to talk about what are, how are we gonna handle these people coming in yeah. because this is these are the colonizers now. Yeah. But this is just before they were actually colonizing mm -hmm. and settling here. They were just coming here. Yeah. And the sad thing is probably also that the meetings became far less attended. Oh, because yeah. even before colonization, even before we, we tend to think New England colonization starts in the 1620s with the Mayflower, right? Mm -hmm. But what we tend to forget is uh, there's already a lot of European fishermen that are fishing in the area. There's also European slave raiders. Mm -hmm. um, ever thought how Squanto learned English? He was one of various Native Americans from New England that was captured as a slave. He was lucky enough to it, that someone bought his freedom, and over a year, years long of trip, he made it back to New England. Wow. Right. Uh, but there's many examples like Squanto that they get a one-day one trip to, uh, they get a one-way trip to the Caribbean and it's pretty much a death sentence. And or I think people f often forget that the natives were also slaves. In fact, you can tie the, the, the history of African slavery in Massachusetts, it starts out with Native American slavery. Mm. In the 1630s, mm -hmm. the New English colonists capture a lot of Native people called the Pequot. 
and many of these captives are turned into slaves. And so you have the codification of Massachusetts slavery tied, and which we tend to think about connected to African, which is certainly the case. Right. Um, but you also, it starts really out with Native Americans. And then over, over decades and centuries, you have a lot of intermixing between people of African descent and Native Americans because they're basically the lower strata of right. either the poor servants or the slave labor in, in the house. And so there's, that, that's part of New England survival. And, uh, mm -hmm. and it's a complicated history in the 19th century, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very sad history, too, in yes, many ways. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So going back to the pre-colonial times, right when they're first yeah. arriving, how did, how, how th uh, they could not have been happy about these new, col these new English coming in. Yes. So how did they handle that? Well, first off, there's or a lot of... how did they impact them, yeah. too? So, right? uh, first off, it's, there's a lot of disease. Mm. So, uh, a lot of Native Americans die. Probably in the stretch of the 16th to the mid-17th century, so roughly around 17, scholars estimate about 50 to 90 percent of, wow. of the population dies. So, in many ways, that makes things more complicated. So, the New English arrive. There is a certain amount of free farmland because so many Native people have died, they have to reconsolidate reconsol their settlements. Their communities have to be recreated, which is why it makes tricky. What do we call Native Americans? Are they Penacook? Right. Are they Pawtucket? There are communities in flux and fluid mm -hmm. because of this waves of epidemics. There's one in, in the 16, in the early decade of the, six, uh, in the first decade of the 1600s, then before the Mayflower, probably 1617, 1619, another wave two waves of epidemics in the 1630s, then another one in the 1650s. So there's, wow. there, is, there is big mortality. What this means in actual numbers, we don't know. But mm -hmm. it is pretty clear from colonial records and from, 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 from the Native American accounts that we have, um, often delivered through colonial records, that there is massive mortality. I think wow. there is one record that I came off by a, by a m fellow named Daniel Gukin, who was um, superintendent for Native American Affairs in 17th century Ma Massachusetts. And he, he estimated, and this was a number given to him by, um, by um, Native American informers, that the population of the Penacook had declined by 90%. Oh my goodness. So and all from sickness? Likely, and then right. slave raiding, warfare, right. Uh, dispossession and it's it's a it's a crisis situation right and and so when if you're impacted in this big way losing so many numbers of people it, it's pretty hard to fight back yes yes oh, wow. and in fact you have this Native American leader named Passa Conaway which is again a name we hear a lot in New England right. he in the 1640s basically decides to subjugate his people under the authority of the colonial, uh, basically under Mass Bay Colony. And so basically he says, we are now part of Mass Bay Colony. And you have this with a lot of Southern New England groups. They basically realize we've got the New English knocking at our doors, and we've got interior groups uh, like the Mohawks coming into our territory raiding. Up north, you have uh, a group called the Tarantines that raid into the 1610s, 1620s, 1630s, probably due to the fur trade with the French. So you have a lot of Native Americans encroaching on this territory, too, in search for fur. So Native Americans are in an extremely vulnerable position. So there's, there's the New English, right? But there's also other Native people. And so they are right. trying to figure out ways to make it work with the colony. Wow, so we're really talking survival now at yes. this point. It's, yes. it, we can't even thrive anymore. Yes. We just have to stay alive. Yes. Wow, and then for the whole population to dwindle by 90%. Yes. That, that is, that's pretty devastating. Yes, and again, I mean, who knows about these numbers, but I right. think it's, it, it, is, it is a significant p portion of the population. And I, I think that 90% might really um, encapsulate it, yes. Wow. Wow, so, so we're having warring factions. We have this, this, this colonizing threat. We have the threat of slave, slavery right over our heads. Mm -hmm. What do we do? So they, there's the, the, the Panacook populations de definitely seek accommodation with the colony. Mm -hmm. They realize, too, 1640s, yes, we s we've 
we've become we've moved ourselves under the authority, but the Mohawks are still raiding and the colony really doesn't help us. Which right. is why maybe they've built this a, a fort up on 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 the hi Fort Hill, right? In Lowell. Right. It's called Fort Hill because supposedly Native Americans in the mid 17th century built a fort up there to protect themselves against uh, uh, Mohawk encroachment. But so there's also then another element that is you have this, this uh, a fellow named John Elliot who mm. is a missionary and we have the Elliot Church named after him, uh, now a Presbyterian church and meeting point of Presbyterians of European ancestry, mm -hmm. Africans and Cambodians. It's a great place. Right. Um, but he also starts what is called a praying town right here in downtown Lowell, about 2,500 acres, which is minimal for a, a, a praying town. But so this becomes a way for Native Americans to secure a piece of land. But what also happens uh, is that the uh, general court, which is basically the legislative of the, of the, of, of the, the, co the Mass Bay Colony, also says, well, you get this land. But settlers from, uh, from Concord and Woburn will get the rest of the land. And that leads to the creation of Billerica and Chelmsford. And Billerica and Chelmsford at that point also means Tewksbury, it means Lowell, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so in the 1650s, that leads to the creation of these settlements, which again leads to further tensions down the road when we hit King Philip's War. Wow. So Bob and I often talk about refugees and how Lowell was a place for refugees. Imagine being a refugee in your own space. Yes. That's what this is <coughs> telling me. Like, wow, that and not even getting adequate aid yes. at that time. Yes. And again, it's also not only the refugees who originate in this place, but you have a lot of people from southern New England mm -hmm. moving in, just like the people here during King Philip's War will move up north and find, uh, find refugee with, with kinship. Because war is, again, in terms of disease, mm -hmm. violence, starvation, it's, it's a powder keg that's about to happen. And what's also pretty clear in the 1650s and 1660s, there's more and more land that is, um, and there's an argument among historians. Some historians say it's legally purchased, other mm -hmm. historians and contemporary at the time, well, some of it is legally purchased, some of it is a little bit more shady, right. and I've seen both types of transactions, and, right. and we don't have time to explore this, but what happens in the 1650s, 1660s, and into the 1670s, there's increasing pressure on the very limited land that mm -hmm. Native Americans have left up here, because there's more and more of a demand amongst white settlers, and that culminates into, into this event that is very key in New England history, that's King Philip's War. Wow, so it's always a lack, right, yeah. that it starts a war, and, and maybe some, a little bit of greed, maybe, just yeah. a bit, just a bit. Yeah. Um, so, so tell us more about this war. How does, how does it start, who does it displace, because there's always displacement with war, and who survives? Yes, <laughs> it's, it's complicated. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'll try to keep it brief. So King Philip, who Native Americans call Metacomet is a Wampanoag leader who lives actually down on the South Shore, right? Mm. But what King Philip is able to do, and the c start, the colonists blame Native Americans, Native Americans blame the colonists. I think there's a lot of blame going around, and it was just one of those things. Is a powder keg, the demand for land, it would have blown at some point, and right. it just happens to blow with King Philip's war. Um, it's an extremely violent conflict, and it's often painted as sort of Native Americans against English. And it's not accurate. Right. It's very complicated. So, to sum it up, in terms of devastation and impact, King Philip's War can, can arguably be, be said it's the most deadly war in American history because of oh. percentage of um, people dying, of the population, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's about at least two-thirds of New England towns and New English towns uh, that are being devastated. And for Native Americans, that rate is even higher. Right. So it is an extremely violent conflict. Right, a population that's already been ravished by epidemics exactly. and slavery, yeah. and now they barely have anything to their yeah. name, and then to then incur this very violent war. Yeah. Oh my goodness. But then there's also sort of, that's the sort of the warring factions of, of Native American. King Phillips, some Nipmucks, some other Indians from further out. 
But then you have also people like the community here. Uh, Pastor Conway, who I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. is by this point replaced by a fellow named Juana Lancet. And Juana Lancet doesn't want to fight. But he also doesn't want to fight his native friends. So he says, we're staying neutral. And that's really not an option. So right. some of Juana Lancet, and Juana Lancet had been arrested in the 1640s already, so he did not trust the colonial authorities. Many of the, by the time of King Philip's War, many of Juan Lance and his followers f go up north. The ones that are staying in this area, there's over 100 march to Boston. Wow. Then they're being left off, some of them. And many of them flee. Um, other praying town, and then you have the Wamasi population. Uh, many of the praying town Indians are being arrested during King Philip's War. They're allies of the colony in many instances, and they're brought onto Deer Island in Boston Harbor, where it's now the sewage wow. plant is on it. Right. And they're basically s incarcerated in, in uh, internment camps kind of conditions, freezing winter. And if you've ever been out there, I mean, it blows in the winter. Very yeah. little protection, very poorly supplied. It's, it's a nightmare. Wow. Many of the men in that internment camp because their their ties are kind of, they end up fighting on the side of the New English. Mm. Um, bringing it back up to Lowell, you still have Wamasi. Basically, there is a murder of a boy, and then basically whoever is still up here who's not hasn't fled up north to New Hampshire or isn't on Deer Island, basically decides to make a run for it. But some of the people, at least twelve, maybe more stay behind because they're too sick and too old to travel. Oh my goodness. And that village is, uh, Wamasi is burned down by Chelmsford settlers. Wow. And likely many of the people too sick to leave burned alive in the buildings. Oh my goodness. So yes, sorry. Oh well, yeah, <laughs> no, well, this is our history. Yes. You know, we, have to we have to know. <laughs> and so uh, basically what that means in terms of the native presence in this region, it is a devastating event. It's mm. a massacre. Um, Juan Lancet remains loyal and neutral to the English, and he remains loyal. I mean, he's just, in a sense, playing all sides, but in the same, same sense, it's like he warns English, New English settlers in the area often when raids are coming. So um, it's sur surprising that even though this massacre was committed by Chelmsford settlers, how few attacks happen in this particular, in the greater Lowell area by Native, Native Americans. And, and some people have argued this was one Lancet who wow. basically protected the people in the area. Right. And one Lancet sticks around for a couple of, comes back after King Philip's War, sticks around, but then relocates up north. This is what a lot of the folks from this area do. They might join up with communities in Canada. They might join up, stay in New Hampshire, stay with communities there. Some of them just join up with communities in, in, uh, in New York. Others maybe with Eastern Abenakis up, up north. So they're basically all over northern New England and Canada and, and New York. Wow. But there's also people that remain. For example, after King Philip's War, there is Again, this is like you find one letter or one document. There's this, um, this report of like these 12 Native American kids that are basically turned into serfs in New English families. Mm. And this is sort of the continuation of the history of slavery we have talked about right. and, and indentured servitude. So Native Americans remain in this area in through the 18th century as agricultural labor, intermixing with African Americans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you also have still like smaller pockets of indigenous settlements all over the Merrimack River Valley where people just stay behind to continue building their wigwams. And you have continuously Native American presence. Wow. Yeah. So they, they just keep persisting. Mm -hmm. Wow, what a resilient people. Yes. I can't even imagine to yep. be, have, to have gone through all of that and to still be here. Yes. And even in the, in the uh, so when you read the, the accounts of, and you, you've had a lot of shows on the Mill Girls, right? There's always like, oh, these Native Americans showed up in the canoe <laughs> in, their, in their accounts, right? Wow, And yeah. in fact, you have one Native American uh, mill worker, and probably many, but she was one of the writing uh, people that wrote, uh, Betsy Chamberlain, who identified as, as, as Native Americans. So you have wow. them on the worker side, but you also have these Native Americans showing up in a canoe. And the mill girls were impressed by this because it's sort of like, but in part of what's going, ha what's happening here, these were people that lived in these small enclaves that I have mentioned, 
basically the women and their children would weave baskets all winter. <laughs> and then they would dress up as like the colonial stereotype and what <laughs> 19th century mill girls would think a Native American would, and they show up in their canoes and then they sell their wear. And so it's quite wow. entrepreneurial. And also in the mill girls of town, you have these mentions of Indian doctors. And so you have a continuity into the, um, the 19th century there, so which, wow. is, which is really cool. And oh intermixing goodness. again with African Americans so that there's resilience and, and sort of a cultural recreation that has always right. been part, sort of when Juana Lancet Flees north, or when Wamasi things get hot in southern New England in the 1650s and 1660s, there's an openness to what we would call adopt refugees and outsiders. Mm -hmm. But for Native Americans, this was th this was more seen as like these are our kin. Right. These are people that have suffered. We take mm -hmm. them in. And again, th it seems like I don't mean to romanticize it because right. it sounds a little bit romantic. But there's also a clear calculation on behind it. We've mm -hmm. lost a lot of people to disease. Right. These are people that are coming in. These are our people. And they are people, right? right? And we yeah. need people exactly. because we have lost so many. Wow. It, it, the way that you are able to encapsulate such, such a vast history, and, and I know there's so much more, excuse me, that we could, we could really delve into, but it's just really amazing to see the resilience of people, and I think that on this show, a recurring theme that we see is solidarity and people standing together and really having to make those very tough decisions. And I can't imagine how hard it must have been for Juana Lancet to support these people who were coming in and infringing on his his own people, mm -hmm. but to also try to maybe in some way try to protect his own by, you know, warning people of the raids and not letting it happen here. Uh, and And then to really just build that solidarity with people who are just also lost yeah. and and that must have been wow and to study it must be like you must feel like a detective <laughs> you, you, and more and it's often frustrating of how little it is and, and it's c kind of like a little reference and like wow this is really interesting i'd like to know more but there just isn't yes right, right. and i mean it's also for someone like Juana lancet he loses a lot of followers. And this yeah. is, again, the fluidity in Native communities. If you, as a, as, a, as a fighter in a community, as a farmer in a community, as a hunter in a community, Native American women, actually, that the farming, but if a couple decides, okay, we don't want to put up with this anymore, mm -hmm. and we should fight the New English, they locate to communities further up north where there is more of a, an aggressive stand. And in fact, you have a lot about this, uh, the, the raids, uh, Native American raids during the various wars of the 18th century. And there are always uh, are the French and their Canadian Indian allies. But the Canadian Indian and Northern New England allies, I mean, a lot of them are Pentecooks from this area. Wow. Or people that know Pentecooks from this area. And they basically know, look what the English done to us. It's time for payback. And they're mm -hmm. coming back. And so when we have the Hannah Dustin story, and, and the abduction of her and, and the big cultural phenomenon that is up in Haverhill, it's really people from this area who originally fled this area and became refugees further up north that come, right. are coming back here and they have an ax to grind. So. And they just want to reclaim their space. Exactly. Wow, wow. Thank you so much, Chris, for coming in and just really, Wow, it's like kind of giving us even more of a foundation to all of this backstory that we've been coming to mm -hmm. so far. Oh, wow, this, it's just been so eye-opening. And I hope that you viewers at home, when you're walking around Lowell and Chelmsford and Bill Ricker, you're thinking about this in just a slightly different way now. Um, go to the Pawtucket Falls, go to Fort Hill, and just pay respect to those who have come before us because they've gone through a lot for us to be able to be here and maybe just think about what it means to be a leader um, in your community and how hard that might be um, for some of us now even trying to make a change. So thank you again for thank coming you. on the show and thank, thank you all for tuning in.